32. Our Advocate McFall, in his account of the gang lords of Chicago in the 1920s, paints an ugly picture of studied lawlessness, murder and contempt of law and order. An important aspect of the power of these gang lords was their ability to buy justice. They could walk in and out of court knowing that the judge was their henchman and the good citizen was bound to be a loser against them. The courts had become instruments of oppression in too many cases. Instead of being a terror to evildoers as God requires, Romans 13.3, the courts then were, and too often are today, a terror to the godly. A court should be a friend to the friends of law. It should protect the godly against all evil and strictly judge all criminals brought before it. Where such a court exists, a people can live in reasonable security, If, in addition to this, the judge is a personal friend who, when we are involved in any infraction of the law, intercedes for us and administers us a private rebuke or discipline and a public defence, our security and peace of mind is certainly greater. A similar situation, perhaps a far more favourable situation, is ours in Christ before the court of Almighty God. St. John describes the privilege clearly in 1 John 1 8 to 2 3. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And hereby we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. This is a remarkable passage in that, very clearly, Jesus Christ is declared to be our advocate not merely when we are righteous, but when we sin. John Bunyan wrote a telling book on the significance of this text, declaring, When a man's cause is good, it will sufficiently plead for itself, yea, and for its matter too, especially when it is made to appear so to be before a just and righteous judge. Here, therefore, needs no advocates, the judge himself will pronounce him righteous. But if it was to plead good causes for which Christ is appointed advocate, then the apostle should have written thus. If any man be righteous, we have an advocate with the Father. Indeed, I never heard but one in all my life preach from this text, and he, when he came to handle the cause for which he was to plead, pretended it must be good, and therefore said to the people, See that your cause be good, else Christ will not undertake it. But when I heard it, Lord, thought I, if this be true, what shall I do, and what will become of all this people, yes, and of this preacher too? Besides, I saw that by the text the apostle supposeth another cause, a cause bad, exceeding bad, if sin can make it so. And this was one cause why I undertook this work. With this in mind, let us examine St. John's statements. St. John begins in 1 8 by condemning as heresy the idea that the believer is made sinless by Christ's redemption. If we claim sinlessness, we are self deceived, and the truth is not in us. In 1 9, according to Ross, a further fact is set forth. The existence of sin is a patent fact, but it does not make fellowship with God impossible. In fact, St. John declares in 1.10, our communion with God is non-existent if we claim to be sinless because we make him to be a liar and his word is not in us. Thus, the very ground of our fellowship involves the fact that we know ourselves to be sinners who stand before God only by the atoning work of Jesus Christ. It is thus the confession of our sins which makes God faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1. 9. 
It is only when we stand before God as sinners saved by grace that we stand at all. We are to avoid sin, John makes clear, but when we sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. To one. Our advocate does not plead our innocence. He acknowledges our guilt and presents his vicarious sacrifice as the ground of our acquittal. To two. We know that he is our advocate if we keep his commandments. To three. Keeping the commandments means being vigilant and watchful to discover them and to observe them strictly. Such is the force of the word. We are thus on the side of the law, but we are sinners still. It is necessary to understand what St. John means when he speaks of sin. In 3 4, he writes, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. The word translated as transgression is anomia, without law. The man who continually practices sin is lawless, without law. He cannot be a Christian. The Christian can be guilty, not of continual sin or lawlessness, but of sins, particular breaches of a law. He seeks more and more to obey. In his sinning, the Christian has an attorney for the defence. Jesus Christ as advocate. The word translated as advocate is parakletos, which we have in English as the paraclete. It is also translated in John 14, 16, 26, 15, 26 and 16, 7 as the comforter. Parakletos, literally, called to one's side, that is, to one's aid, and suggests the capability or adaptability for giving aid. It was used in a court of justice to denote a legal assistant, counsel for the defence, an advocate, as in 1 John 2, 1, of the Lord Jesus. In the widest sense, it signifies a succorer, comforter. Christ was this to his disciples by the implication of his word, another comforter when speaking of the Holy Spirit. Christ is our propitiation, elasmos, expiation, a means whereby sin is covered and remitted. Vine noted. It is used in the New Testament of Christ himself as the propitiation in 1 John 2.2 2 and 4.10, signifying that he himself, through the expiatory sacrifice of his death, is the personal means by whom God shows mercy to the sinner who believes on Christ as the one thus provided. In the former passage, he is described as the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. The italicized edition in the AV, the sins of, gives a wrong interpretation. What is indicated is that provision is made for the whole world so that no one is, by divine predetermination, excluded from the scope of God's mercy. The efficacy of the propitiation, however, is made actual for those who believe. Fine sought to make the passage rule out predestination, a blasphemous attempt, since Scripture so plainly affirms it. Calvin's comment is sound here and a corrective to Vine. The design of John was no other than to make the benefits common to the whole church. Then, under the word all or whole, he does not include the reprobate, but designates those who should believe as well as those who were then scattered through various parts of the world. For then is really made evident, as it is meet, the grace of Christ when it is declared to be the only true salvation of the world. The effect of this doctrine on the godly man is very great. In his righteousness he is blessed by God the Father. In his sin he has an advocate with the Father. His favourable standing with the court is predetermined. The result is not a freedom to sin, but a progressive freedom from sin. His advocate has made propitiation for his sins. He is the regenerating power in the sinner's heart and his defence against all enemies. 
Because a believer, the redeemed man in Christ, has a predetermined release, he has a concomitant freedom and, by God's renewing grace, a concomitant power. His forgiveness carries with it a freedom and power to do God's will and, as a result, the redeemed man goes out of court with power to conquer his enemies. The man who enters a human court to plead guilty comes out under sentence and in bondage and rightly so. The man, however, who goes into God's court to plead guilty and does so as a member of Jesus Christ has an advocate who secures his release and sends him out to conquer the world in his name. The Christian man is the only free man. The Christian man alone can undertake and sustain a true reconstruction of society because he alone has both the freedom and the power to accomplish that task. Because the Christian man recognises himself as a sinner before God, he alone can fulfil the ancient commandment of the humanists to know thyself. He can cope with crime because he knows the roots of it in himself and he knows its cause. As Ewing has written of crime, The first and primary cause is spiritual. It is the expression of wrong heart conditions, Matthew 15, 16-20. Nothing short of a radical change of heart wrought by the Spirit of Christ Jesus in the persons involved will meet this need, but we are told it is not the province of the state to deal with morals. But we shall find out before we solve this problem that this is a most fundamental issue. When we get ready to equate crime and sin as the same and deal with this matter as sin and not just sickness, we'll solve the problem. The Christian man can see the relationships of things because he is not blinded by sin. Because he has an omnipotent advocate, he is a free man and a powerful man.